October 1307, Friday the 13th, hundreds of Knights Templar had been summoned to Paris. Suddenly, 620 were arrested and thrown in jail. The accusations levied at the Templars added up to the worst charge possible, heresy. But the Knights Templar were Christian warrior heroes, the SAS of the medieval crusades. They were the best trained soldiers since the Roman Empire. So why were these devout and popular warriors brought to their knees? At last, a secret document, hidden for 700 years, reveals the truth about the greed, politics, and power play that would destroy the most legendary military elite in history. Jerusalem, the birthplace of Christianity, the most important city of the medieval world. If one takes a map of Jerusalem, of the Crusader period, it's depicted as the navel of the world, the center of the world. It was a place of religious tolerance, and Christian pilgrims enjoyed safe passage. But, by the 11th century, the Christians were under attack. 3,000 were massacred and the Christian churches violated. There was outrage. In 1095, the Pope exhorted the Christian world to capture the Holy Land from the Muslims. One of the bloodiest holy wars in history had just begun. Very quickly, tens of thousands of people, mostly people who were not soldiers, not fighters, had no experience in fighting and had, in fact, never left their villages, uh, answered the call of the Pope and set out to the east. Within four years, the Christians had taken Jerusalem. Out of the ranks of the Crusaders arose the Templar Knight. A unique blend of monk and soldier, strong in their faith. Their job? To police the new Christian kingdom of Jerusalem and protect pilgrims. For the first time in history, a holy order was commanded to take up arms, answerable only to the Pope. It was the Templars who first introduced this idea of combining a monastic lifestyle with uh, knighthood and with military activity. They lived according to a monastic rule. Their day was uh, organized uh, between prayers and training and looking after the equipment. The Templars emerged as an elite military unit. Famed for their valor and purity, they were also ruthless defenders of the faith. When they first appeared on the world stage, they, they sort of caught people's imaginations in many ways. People thought this was a really good thing. With reports of their victories reaching Europe, the Templars became the superheroes of Christianity. Initially a band of nine, their numbers grew rapidly as their reputation soared. They quickly became legendary and a source of mystery. Myths, rumors, stories swirled around them like a mist, and they seemed to have encouraged that. They certainly didn't discourage it. In fact, it could be said that they actually hid behind their own myth for much of their career. A contemporary commentator, Bernard of Clairvaux, described them as strong warriors on the one hand and monks waging war with vice and demons on the other. A body of men who need have no fear. These men had no dread of death, confident in the knowledge that in the sight of the Lord, they would be his martyrs. Mm -hmm. 
But almost two centuries after their foundation, the most celebrated Christian warriors of the medieval era, who had lived and died under the sign of the cross, had been arrested and jailed on charges of heresy. The public reaction to the arrest of the Templars was enormous. There was huge uproar in Germany, where the Templars were extremely popular. And in Spain and Portugal, um, the kings there didn't believe the accusations. Nobody could believe that the Templars, who had been Christianity's heroes for the last 200 years, had been arrested on charges of heresy. After thousands of Templar knights had died fighting for their faith in the Holy Land for two centuries, why were these heroes suddenly being charged with heresy? Paris, 1307. The Knights Templar have been arrested by French King Philip IV. Charged with heresy after almost 200 years crusading for the Christian faith in the Holy Land. Was there any truth in his accusation? Did the Templars have something to hide? The Templars were incredibly secretive right from the start of their career. Rumors, stories, myths surrounded them. The Templars were keen to hide their activities, especially their source of power and wealth. The order had been quietly formed in Jerusalem in 1119. 20 years after the Christians took the city, a French knight founded the order to protect pilgrims in the Holy Land. So how did they end up with fortresses and churches all over Europe, with a massive power base to rival the European monarchs? Is the answer rooted in the Templars' mysterious reputation as relic hunters? Relics were the status symbols of the medieval era, more collectible than cash or jewels. The relics that were of most interest to the medieval collectors came from the Holy Land. They were sought and fought over and venerated in monasteries and cathedrals right across Europe. Templari erano famosi nella loro epoca perché custodivano The Templars were famous worldwide as custodians of relics, particularly those directly from the story of Christ. Venivano anche A Templar signature alone was enough to prove a relic's authenticity. I certificati di autenticità delle reliquie. Part of the mystique that led to the canonization of French King Louis IX was his purchase of two major relics. A fragment of the true cross and the crown of thorns. Both bought by Saint Louis when the Templars were at their peak. Saint Louis, uh... St. Louis designed and built this chapel as a reliquary, an enormous reliquary for the relics of the story of Christ which he had purchased. People believed that relics were the closest physical way to touch God. Those St. Louis had purchased had made France the center of Europe, spiritually and politically. Louis had promoted Paris as the new Jerusalem. The source of relics from the story of Christ was, of course, Jerusalem, and the Templars' home was at the very heart of it. The Templars were established on the Temple Mount, over in this area on the southern part of the Temple Mount, where the Al-Aqsa Mosque is situated, and the mosque became the headquarters of the Templar order. So they were located in the most important area of Jerusalem. It was also the site of the Jewish temple, believed to have been full of religious artifacts, including Christian relics. There were originally only nine Templars. How could nine men possibly provide protection for thousands of pilgrims? 
were the early Templars actually digging for relics under their own base. They certainly dug on the Temple Mount, there's no doubt about that, because we know they were carrying out a lot of building activity, including warehouses and baths and the construction of a new palace, which would have required digging into the Temple Mount itself. And they may well have dug passages underneath the Temple Mount. This is the subterranean tunnel which was uh, discovered by Charles Warren in 1867. At that time it was full of sewage and he floated down on the top of a, a wooden door. This tunnel um, is one of many hundreds which are under Jerusalem itself and indeed under the Temple Mount. The Templars could have been searching for artifacts that would have brought them great influence, or even made them a target of envy much later on. This is a medieval gate, but originally it was built in the Roman period. So of all the gates along the western side of uh, Temple Mount, one could be certain that this gate was used by the Templars. This was the entrance to the ancient Jewish Temple of Solomon. This temple could have been a gold mine of treasures for the Templars. Undoubtedly, the Templars had this passion for relics. It was quite an obsession. And those who came to the country were willing to um, kill not only Jews and Muslims, but also uh, local Christians in their search for relics. One relic said to have passed through the Templar's hands was the burial cloth apparently imprinted with Christ's body, now known as the Turin Shroud. Believed to have turned up in Paris with St. Louis in the middle of the 13th century, the Templars were ideally placed to have brought him the shroud. They had the method. They had boats traveling to and from the Holy Land all the time. And remember, the Knights Templar was a religious order with a reputation for trustworthiness. The most sought after relic was the Holy Grail. A quest that continues across the world to this day Often believed to be the cup that Jesus blessed at the Last Supper, the grail was first mentioned in a romantic story by the French poet Chrétien of Troyes. And Troyes was the birthplace of most Templar knights. The Templars themselves were from the Troyes region, and so maybe Chrétien heard things from returning Templars or returning Crusaders who'd heard things from Templars in the East about this mysterious grail. The grail has been described in many ways. In Chrétien of Troyes' original story, the grail is a platter. Robert de Bouron describes the grail as a chalice used by Joseph of Arimathea to collect the blood of Christ. In Wolfram von Eschenbach's poem, Parsifal Searches for the Grail, which interestingly, Wolfram describes as a stone. This stone could represent a number of things, such as spiritual awakening or the grace of God. But as ever, the grail seems to resist being pinned down to one form. The grail provided a handy smokescreen. While people were distracted by grail myths, the Templars could continue with their real activities undisturbed. The Templars were never obliged to actually say what they were doing. As far as everybody was concerned, they were fighting in the East. But they were also really good at making money. The Templars became a vast multinational corporation building castles and churches all over Europe. 
they also invented international banking and the check. Travelers deposited money at one temple and got a note which could be exchanged for cash at another temple, a popular service for pilgrims to the Holy Land. The fees from this helped make the Templars vastly wealthy. The operations in the east were supported by places such as here, um, their western commanderies, which were farms, all, all manner of businesses like wi uh, wineries, vineyards, tanning factories, tile factories. So they were running a very good interconnected series of businesses. So they were, you know, they were the first capitalists, if you like. Merchants and royals also donated to the order, rushing to buy a place in heaven. Templars were exempt from paying taxes. Powerful and strong, they were the Pope's men. After the church, the temple was the richest institution in Europe. Would this contribute to their downfall? While the order's banks were getting full, their luck was running out in the Holy Land. In the 1150s, the tide had turned in the Crusades. Muslim Sultan Saladin led a renewed force. 70 miles north of Jerusalem, the Battle of Khatim was the beginning of the end. The big mistake of the Crusader army was in coming to face Saladin under his terms in very difficult conditions in the heat of the summer and traveling to the east facing the sun in the early hours of the morning on the 4th of July, they found themselves surrounded by a much stronger army. Defeat came swiftly. 20,000 Christian Crusaders were slaughtered. Three months later, October 1187, Jerusalem was captured by Saladin. The Knights Templar were forced to abandon the Temple Mount. Four years later, their stronghold had been moved to Acre, on the coast of the Holy Land. The Templars, who had a certain amount of, uh, of ships, would have brought equipment and troops uh, and other supplies in through Port in Acre and turned Acre into their main uh, urban headquarters. As the Crusader corps in the east began to die, the Knights Templar held on, refusing to leave and continuing to wage war from fortresses like Acre. But even their might started to dwindle. After a hundred years and six more ardent campaigns, it was over. In 1291, the Knights Templar finally abandoned the Holy Land. The Templars returned to Europe, most of them to France. At the same time, Jacques de Molay was appointed Grand Master 16 years later, the aged warrior still dreamt of reclaiming Jerusalem. But his order now faced a different enemy, Philip IV, King of France. Philip was the grandson of the great relic collector, Louis IX, the Saint King. He was an extremist with a Christ complex. Philip was an incredibly ambitious king and one of his main, I think one of the things that motivated him the most was the desire to be the most Christian king in Europe 
and he would stop at nothing to achieve that end. Philippe Lebel, le roi de France, veut faire comprendre ainsi que... Philip thinks that as a direct descendant of St. Louis, a saint king, he's therefore the face of Christ on earth. Lui, le roi de France, l'image du Christ sur la terre. He's not the king, but Christ himself. Non, c'est le Christ. But the king was in trouble. Philip had been borrowing money from the Templars to help finance his wars against the English, and by 1307, he was desperately short of funds. His kingdom was on the verge of bankruptcy. He needed the Templars' money, and by the beginning of the 1300s, the Crusaders had no reason to exist anymore. Without relevance in the Crusades, the Templars were vulnerable. Their banks were full of Crusader cash, and the king knew it. Philip actually took refuge in the Paris temple in June 1306. He was devaluing the currency, and that led to an angry mob pursuing him through the streets of Paris, and he had to take refuge inside the temple. It was there that he actually saw some of the temple's treasure. This was gold and coins and so on. Philip decided to neutralize the Templars and strip their assets but they were not his to control. Only the Pope could legitimately rule the order. The king needed to destabilize them. Rumors about the Templars were certainly being manipulated by Philip IV to be very negative and defamatory about the order. The rumors were a kind of poison that Philip IV very skillfully used to damage the order. Then, in 1307, having smeared the reputation of the order, the king launched his surprise attack, snatching Jacques de Molay and every Templar in Paris. Buried deep in the National Archives of Paris is one of the arrest orders sent across France for use on that infamous Friday the 13th. The king attacked the secrecy of Templar initiations, suggesting deviant behavior behind closed doors. They were accused of financial corruption and sodomy. The Templars were also accused of idolatry, including worshiping a cat. And it all added up to a catastrophic charge, heresy. The charge of heresy was totally devastating because the temple was founded to defend the faith and heresy is betraying the faith. So this charge had the power to destroy the temple order. Templar chief Jacques de Molay was slammed with 104 charges of misconduct and heresy. He had given 42 years devout service to the order. Surely, Philip's charges couldn't stick. Then, two weeks after the arrests, inexplicably, Jacques made a complete confession, admitting to the charges of heresy. Jacques de Molay's first confession in October 1307, a mere two weeks after the arrests, was incredibly damaging for the Templar order and the public's perception of them. Christianity's heroes faced death as heretics. But what had made Jacques de Molay suddenly confess? And could anyone now save them from paying the ultimate price? After 200 years fighting under the sign of the cross in the Holy Land, the Grand Master of the Templars destroyed their reputation with a confession of heresy. The French king was winning his war against the Knights Templar. And what a prize he was anticipating. The Paris Temple would have been a fortified building in which the Templars had all of their hard currency. 
The Templars were acting as bankers both to the king and to the wealthy burghers of Paris. The cash was a little closer now that the king had imprisoned the five leaders here at Chinon Castle. And what's more, the Templar Grand Master had handed the king a confession of heresy. But what was the real reason for de Molay's sudden confession? Torture. The rack was used on young and old. And the strapado, a winch that dropped the bound Templar from a height and jerked him violently. Bernard of Vado's feet were rubbed with fat and roasted over a fire until his bones slid out. Philip IV used torture because torture was normal practice with trials at that time. He didn't torture them so they told the truth. He tortured them so they told his truth. But Philip wasn't going to get it all his own way. Because the Knights Templar were a religious military order, they were directly under the protection of the Pope. Neither the King of France nor the King of England had rights or direct power over them. The Pope was the only man who could save the Templars. But the papacy was at its weakest point in history. Clement V was little more than a puppet Pope, subject to the whim of Philip IV. The king had single-handedly destroyed a previous pope and had enforced the appointment of Clement. And Philip continued to make sure the pope knew who was in charge. Philip IV's agents wrote many anonymous letters accusing the pope of heresy. It was an attempt to undermine Clement V's reputation on all fronts. It was even said that he had an affair with a very beautiful lady, the wife of a French nobleman. Reluctantly, Clement was the king's man. And he was made to stay in Avignon, France. For the first time in history, the Pope wasn't even allowed to go to the Vatican. Pope Clement V wanted to go to Italy, to the Vatican, because he would have been safer there, but he was always stopped. The King of France kept him as a kind of hostage in his kingdom. But the Pope had one final lifeline that could save the Templars. Obliged to investigate any confession of heresy, Clement managed to turn Philip's attack into a papal inquiry. The truth about that inquiry has never been known, until now. The discovery of a dramatic document rewrites the story of Clement V and the trial of the Knights Templar. In 2003, Vatican historian Dr. Barbara Frale located a document called the Chinon Parchment in the Vatican secret archive. It had been lost for 700 years. The Chinon parchment is the original document of an inquiry run by a commission of cardinals on the Grand Master of the Temple and the other major figures in the order. During Clement V's time, all the Temple documents were put in the same neat and tidy folder. However, over time, 
And because Napoleon raided the papal archives and took them to France, the folder was dismembered and the documents were lost. Questo fondo si smembrò, i documenti andarono dispersi. The Chenon parchment reveals shocking behavior at the heart of the order. At the start of the Pope's Templar inquiry, three of Clement's cardinals had gone to Chinon prison. Far from retracting their earlier confessions of heresy, the Templar leaders repeated the same confessions to the Pope's men. And most of it related to Templar initiation rites, which were covertly established at Trois Cathedral almost 200 years before. This was where they established their first official rule book, known as the Latin rule of the Templars. And this included details of how somebody joined the Templars and what the initiation ceremony was. The order uh, kept their rule book within themselves, within the, the walls of the Templar preceptories. It wasn't distributed or disseminated widely. It was kept very much an in-house affair. According to the official Templar rule book, the initiate was asked if he wanted to be a serf and slave of the house forever. He was warned that if he consorted with women, he would be put in heavy eye. And finally, a psalm was said as the Templar tunic was presented. But the shin on parchment tells a very different story about Templar initiations. All five Templars at Chinon admitted denouncing Christ after the formal rites. Geoffrey de Charny described how the brother who performed the ceremony took him aside within the same chapel and showed him a crucifix with an effigy of Christ and told him that he should not believe in the crucified, but should, in fact, denounce him. Hugues de Perrault confessed that the Templar initiation ceremony involved disowning Christ and spitting on the cross. Jacques de Molay repeated the confession he had given to the king, saying that the receptor showed him the cross and told him that he should denounce the God whose image was depicted on that cross and that he should spit on the cross, which he did. Hugh de Parot went even further, describing how he had encouraged heresy and sexual depravity in those he had initiated. After they were received and given the cloaks of the order, he ordered them to denounce the crucifix and to kiss him at the bottom of the back, in the navel, and then on the mouth. The kiss was a humiliating part of the ritual for the new Templar, and he was made to understand that he had to be subordinate and obedient to his superior. Hugh de Parot also confessed to encouraging homosexuality, considered an abomination by the church. He imposed on them to abstain from partnership with women, and if they were unable to restrain their lust, to join themselves with brothers of the order. They set up a ritual of obedience that was of an improper and indecent nature for a religious order. The shin on parchment adds up to a litany of heresies. The Templars had admitted to homosexuality, denouncing Christ and defiling the cross. The Templars' first confession after arrest had been tortured out of them by Philip IV. But had the Pope's men done the same? Are the Shinon confessions reliable? We are sure that in the trials led by the Pope, the Templars were not tortured. 
the Templars were in trouble. De Mole and his deputies had damned themselves before representatives of the highest Christian authority in the world. But there was one slender chance they could be saved from the death penalty by being officially forgiven by the Pope. Absolution was necessary for salvation because the charge of heresy was an extremely serious case. The Lord demanded absolution, otherwise salvation was impossible. The shin on parchment contains one further revelation. Despite people believing for centuries that the Pope had condemned the Templars, in fact, he had saved them. He absolved de Molay and the leaders unconditionally. There was a tendency to believe the church condemned the Templars. However, that is wrong. If the Pope had the slightest suspicion of real heresy, he would never have allowed them to receive the communion. The Pope absolved the Templars because he believed they were committing heretical acts as a test of endurance before facing real Muslim heresies in the Holy Land. It was just a kind of role play, a test of obedience. Strong, disciplined and courageous men were needed to fight in the Holy Land against the Muslims who used to force their Christian prisoners to renounce their faith or face death. But it appears the Templars' unchristian tendencies weren't limited to play acting. There were traces of heresy within the order, even if limited and inevitable within an organization 20,000 strong. On the walls of the prison at Shinon, Templar prisoners left behind odd graffiti. Among geometric shapes, clearly inscribed in one wall, is the symbol for Venus, a pagan Roman goddess. A flower emerging from a heart on another wall suggests reference to Aphrodite, the Greek goddess of love. Those two goddesses themselves are pagan. To have any sort of appreciation of pagan culture is definite heresy in the eyes of the church. Part of the prosecution had rested on the charge of worshipping a craven idol, a severed head called a Baphomet. One of the many rumours about the Templars and the Temple Mount is that they found a relic um, under the mount, uh, one of which is said to have been nothing less than the embalmed head of John the Baptist. If the Templars were indeed worshipping the Baphomet, then that was a seriously heretical accusation. Away from sinister inscriptions and severed heads, it appears Templar behaviour also challenges their reputation as monastic Christians. Although um, they were champions of Christendom, the Templars were also flesh and blood human beings, uh, with all the faults that that brings with it. This is borne out by a saying from the time, to drink like a Templar. It is impossible to know for sure whether the Templars had committed heretical acts for training purposes or not. But they had undoubtedly died for the Christian cause for 200 years on the battlefield. And the Pope had loyally wiped out their sins. The Pope was, of course, the highest religious authority. Once absolved by the Pope, the Templars were clean. They were free from charges. The knights were exempt from sins. Surely now, the Templars were saved. But the king wasn't going to give up that easily. He played his final card. Philip IV blackmailed the Pope. Either the Pope was to accept the destruction of the Templars, or the King of France would create 
with the bishops of France, a breakaway Church of France separate from the Catholic Church. It was the trump card, a battle between the king and pope for religious power in Europe. Faced with the choice between the splitting of his church and giving up the order, Clement V gave in. Despite having absolved the Knights Templar, he sold them down the river. In a final act of betrayal, he abolished the Order of the Knights Templar in March 1312. The order, once described as a body of men who need have no fear, had been extinguished. But the showdown was about to see one final twist and a crushing disappointment for the French king. The Knights Templar were abolished in the power struggle between king and pope. Their assets were the prize, and they were the price. Though they had been absolved, Clement had wiped out the order and left the Templar's reputation in the dirt. Jacques de Molay had been in prison for over six years. He was exhausted. Before the old man could be forced to restate his confession publicly and condemn his whole life's work, he withdrew the confession, throwing the Pope's absolution back in his face. He rebelled. He realized he'd made a mistake, that he had it all wrong. He said, I never admitted all those errors. They're false. The order is pure. The order is holy. And I defend it. Philip IV seized the moment. Within hours, he had the 72-year-old man snatched and taken to the River Seine in Paris to be executed. De Molay asked to have his hands free to pray towards Notre Dame as a pyre was lit. But the old warrior had left behind one last Parisian mystery. As the Templars were swept away, their biggest bank, the Paris Temple, was raided by the king's men. It was empty. Templar assets in Normandy alone amounted to more than the wealth of England. Yet nothing was found. Philip IV's destruction of the Knights Templar had all been for nothing. The actual cash treasure, the gold, disappeared completely wasn't found in any of their main preceptories, such as London, Paris, or Vienna. Uh, we simply don't know where it went. The order must have received some kind of notice about Philip's plan, allowing the less prominent knights to escape. Had they taken the assets of the order with them? Around the time of the arrests, the Templar fleet here in La Rochelle disappeared. No one's ever been able to ascertain how many boats there were here, what they contained, but they completely vanished off the face of the earth. Did the Knights Templar actually get the last laugh after all? The best place for fleeing Templars and their treasure was Scotland, where Robert the Bruce protected them. But to this day, nothing has ever been found. Many Templars were accepted into an older, rival order, the Knights Hospitaller. Before the arrests, the Pope had suggested the merging of the two. A combined order may have survived an attack from Philip IV, but Jacques de Molay had refused and paid the ultimate price for rejecting the Pope's plan. He wanted to unify the Knights Templar with the Knights Hospitaller to create a new order that was going to be pure from sins and useful for the reconquest of Jerusalem. The Hospitallers became the real untouchables and are still in existence today. 
Based in Rome, with observer status at the United Nations, it is the world's oldest charity. Some Templars simply vanished, like the relics most closely associated with them. In 1357, the Turin Shroud turned up very near the Templar heartland in Troyes with Geoffrey de Charnay, a descendant of one of Jacques de Molay's closest deputies. But the Holy Grail has never appeared, drifting through time like the myriad myths of the Knights Templar and their missing treasure. The Templars were ultimately damned by a greedy king, a weak pope, and they were also brought down in many ways by their own success. They were victims of their own mystique. Like the Grail, Jacques de Molay's final prophecy echoes through time. As he burned, the Grand Master cried that he would see the Pope and the King in judgment before God within a year. Philip IV and Clement V were dead within eight months, leaving alive only the powerful legend of the Templars, destroyed for their wealth, mysteriously haunted by the Holy Grail for two centuries, and ultimately betrayed by their closest ally, the Pope.